Welcome to Shanice's Nonfiction Book Club, where I break down for you, my viewers, what's a myth versus fact in the latest bestsellers. For today, we have the supermarket tour by the Ontario Public Interest Research Group in Peterborough. This wonderful book was published in 2011. I found the supermarket tour to be a very interesting read, but was not 100% sure about the claims that they made. So I chose the serial chapter and went to the store for myself to find out what was really happening to give you guys an accurate review. I chose to go to my local Longos as it is the grocery store my family gets groceries from every week. Now, one of the most interesting things that I learned in the supermarket tour is that stores often have just one entrance so that they can influence the way that you shop. Isn't that crazy? Longos, however, has two entrances, one entrance into the produce section and then one entrance where the cash registers are. That's more towards where the dry, the dry foods are. Although people are more likely to enter where the produce aisle is, there's still technically two entrances. Now, there is a whole aisle within the first aisle of Longos that's dedicated to just cereal, which I think is crazy. It's... Now, look at these pictures. What do you think is in common between soybeans and cereal and corn and cereal? A lot of cereals contain corn or soy in many derivatives and forms, as pointed out in the supermarket tour. Highly processed foods are more likely to have soy and corn as an ingredient, and cereals are often highly processed. Now, to confirm or deny the claims made by Oprah as to whether or not corn and soy were prominent components of processed foods, particularly cereal, I chose the cereals at random and looked at the ingredients. Now, this first cereal contains soy flakes as the second ingredient. The second cereal is a cereal that's more marketed as natural, but it still has soy oil as its third ingredient. This next syrup has corn syrup mentioned in its ingredients list not once, but twice. Eating corn and soybeans naturally are probably really good for you, but when you're eating processed versions of them, as mentioned in the supermarket tour, it could be connected to diseases such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and even obesity. I did kind of go looking for some exceptions to this rule. I found two cereals that didn't have any corn or soy derivatives from what I could tell. I thought it was kind of crazy that there was only two cereals that I could find that had didn't have any soy in it. The claims that Oprah made seem to be true for the most part, as it was very hard to find cereals without soy or corn. Now, let's get a little political here. The politics behind corn and soy. According to Oprah, corn is the second most grown crop in the world, with soybeans close behind. They attribute the popularity of corn to government policies and subsidies, which have led to corn being sold cheaper, which kind of explains why it's in so many of the products that we use, because it's such an easy, cheap filler. An alarming stat that I found was that in America, the federal treasury spends $5 billion a year just to subsidize corn. That is a crazy amount of money that I feel could be going to a lot more important or helpful causes. Now, really interest another really interesting part of the supermarket tour is the mention of GMO products. Now, non GMO, yes or no? Haha, <laughs> do you see what I did there? The little rhyme, GMO, no? Anyways. Um one of the concerns mentioned in the book is concerning processed foods as they're more likely to be genetically modified. Now Genetic modification involves editing or modifying DNA of corn and soy in this case, which is common for processed foods. A lot of the fears come 
was in relation to the possible influence of GMO foods on our body in terms of increasing the risk of antibiotic resistant organisms or possibly uh, the connection to, to illnesses like diabetes. And this concern has led to a lot of consumers asking for their products to be labeled whether or not they are GMO or non-GMO. I only found a few cereals that had labels on them that claimed that they were non-GMO, and they're usually the cereals that are more marketed as healthy cereals. Marketing strategies. As mentioned in a lecture by Corzman in 2019 called are supermarkets really to blame? I learned that red is the color that's often used to make people hungry. And boy, did I see a lot of red cereals. Another color used to make people hungry is yellow. And there was a lot of yellow cereals. I saw them everywhere. And then when I thought about it, honestly, most of the cereals that I've had are usually yellow or red. It's kind of crazy to think about how these companies can use these psychological tools to trick us into making purchases. Another really strange marketing strategy that I've never heard of before is putting cheaper products to the right because our eyes are more likely to go from left to right. As in this picture, we can see the cheap, most expensive product is on the left, $6.99, and the most Cheapest product is 649 on the right. This is commonly seen throughout the cereal aisle. Basically what this does is it tries to influence you to buy the cheaper product on the right. And food for thought, how much choice do you really think that you have when you're purchasing your food or your cereal? Do you think that you're buying from a vast variety of companies? If you said yes, I'm really sad to tell you, but you're wrong. In fact, brands like Kellogg's and General Mills own the majority of the cereal market, with about 32% of the market for each of them. Kellogg's um, owns cereal brands such as Old Brand, Apple Jack, Cocoa Krispies, Corn Flakes, and Corn Pops, while General Mills owns products such as Cheerios, Ch Chex, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Lucky Charms, Honey Nut Custards, and Wheaties. We see all of these products put in front of us, and it gives us this illusion that we really have choice. But it's like regardless of what we buy, we're still supporting the same two major companies, which is clear in this photo. In the first one, you can see that there's a lot of Kellogg signs, and in the second one, there's a mixture of some Kraft, Kellogg, and General Mills signs, and then the third picture is, again, a mixture of Kellogg and General Mills signs. Now, what you've all been waiting for, my final review. I found the supermarket tour to be ever very interesting. I recommend it for everyone who wants to be more conscious about the way that they shop. It made me so much more aware of the ingredients within my product and the marketing tools that are being used to sell my products to me. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I believe that this book is biased in any way, maybe in a sense, kind of anti-supermarkets, or it doesn't really show both sides of the picture. It's a bit one-sided, but I can understand why. I didn't really have the greatest expectations before I entered the supermarket. When I read the book, I was leaning more towards the side of realizing that what I was reading was probably pretty accurate, and I was right. I found that a lot of their claims really did stand up to, to be true. Now, what's my final rating? Drum roll, please. Five star rating. I recommend you all to go out and read this book. Maybe start with a serial chapter, or choose another chapter, go to your store, and see if you can relate. and if it's really accurate for yourself. Here are the references that I used, and I'll see you for next week's episode.